Hi, and welcome to another Saturday morning recap of the bloggers that are on my personal blog roll, you know, the one down there. And we wanted to start this series where we interview the bloggers, let them talk about how they've created their blogs and what fascinates them and inspires them to create such wonderful articles that you guys all enjoy reading. Now, my friend Carl Johnson is one of uh, the most foremost experts on Albany cultural history, architectural history. He just finished a series where he found the markers for all the bicentennial markings that the city of Albany put in about 125 years ago. He operates the well-read and well-written blog, hoxie.org. Carl, it is so great to have you here on the Saturday Morning Recap. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks, Chuck, and uh, always appreciate the uh, the blog role support and the uh, the Albany community. It's been a strong blogging community going back quite a few years, and different folks have uh, stepped up through the through the years and kept us all together. And I appreciate your uh, picking up that torch. Uh, my pleasure. So, one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating about your blog is you will pull up some minutiae, whether it's the history of a building, whether it's the history of a, a business in the capital district, and you'll go deep dive into it. And I just find that so fascinating to find all the reasons. Where are some of the best avenues that you have found for pulling up some of this information? I think uh, like a lot of the folks who do any of the local history or genealogy in the Albany area, we rely extraordinarily heavily on uh, FultonHistory.com, which has just a huge archive of scanned newspapers that are relatively searchable. And uh, there, there are a lot of other resources. We all rely on Joel Munsell's Annals of Albany and Kyler Reynolds' uh, History of Albany and, and Arthur James Weiss. They're a great starting point. There are a lot of others, but uh, then when you really want to get into into the crazy minutia, as you say, uh, you go to the old newspapers, and uh, it is really there if you really know how to search for it. It's a challenge, but it's it's all there, and it's it's a lot of fun. I would presume that if you start researching item A somewhere along the line, you'll start traveling down the bunny hole to item B, C, and then you're on item J by the time you've come up for item A. It is absolutely a challenge to stay on focus. And as you mentioned with the recent, and, and I wish I were done, but I, <laughs> there were about 40 of those bicentennial tablets or more that the city put out. Uh, it's hard to know where to stop sometimes. For instance, there's one about the location of the original, uh, not even the original, but the, the second Dutch church, which used to be in the middle of State Street down at the foot of Broadway. And sort of started doing some research on how the church had moved around and how it had split into other churches and got very interested then in what happened to the bodies that used to be buried under the church. So that became, you know, a whole a whole other entry. And luckily, we have uh, friends who are great resources for where the bodies are buried, too. Yeah, I know where the bodies are buried. I know what I did with the shovels. <laughs> exactly. The old, the old Albany political joke. <laughs> now... For those who don't live in the Capital District, one of the most um, most important moments in Albany history, of course, took place starting in the mid-1950s and ending in the mid-1970s, which was the complete demolition of 12 city blocks of Albany to build the Empire State Plaza. How has the story of the renovation of what used to be Albany's inner neighborhoods into the Empire State Plaza influenced what you've been able to research for your blog and for your blog posts? Um, yeah, uh, it's very difficult sometimes because I want to talk about place and place, you know, has a very strong presence for us. But it's very hard to talk about place when I can't point to that place anymore. And at least I would say, you know, the Empire State Plaza gets a lot of attention, but at least there is something there. Uh, recently, I had a problem trying to point out where the original, uh, I think it was the Presbyterian Church had been. 
And that's down in the area where things were just destroyed and very little was put in place, where they tore out for the uh, the Empire State Expressway that goes across to Rensselaer and all the parking lots that are underneath that have been nothing but rubble for 50 or 60 or 70 years at this point. Those all used to be neighborhoods too, and we just kind of don't recognize what's lost. So it's very hard sometimes to give people a reference as to where where life was lived because a lot of that now is just kind of gone. There aren't even buildings uh, to, to point to. So it's hard to imagine how densely populated all of downtown Albany used to be. And, and in addition to the architecture, you've also done posts on the culture of Albany in the past. Things like, for example, the food we used to eat, whether it was the old delicacy of sturgeon, which would have been the branded as Albany beef. And then later in the 60s and 70s, it was uh, Neba roast beef sandwiches, Mike Subs, even up until, you know, the time of Fryhoffers versus Entenmann's, you know, the, the great battle. Do you eat Fryhoffers or are you a heathen? <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly for the, uh, the kinds of foods that people can remember, there is a huge attachment to the Fryhoffer bakery, for instance. People remember where it was. They remember the bread bakeries and the cookies and the, the home delivery, uh, any of the local nostalgia groups. If you're involved in on Facebook, it, you'll eventually see a picture of the Fryhoffer's horse-drawn truck, and it will bring out memories for folks who are old enough to remember the horse-drawn. I am not, but we did have, when I was growing up in Scotia, the, uh, the panel truck that would come by and stop if you left a sign in the window. <laughs> And uh, yeah, people have very strong memories of that. And that's gone back, you know, for, for centuries. You can, uh, baking was regulated in Albany from the time the Dutch were there. Uh, they, they regulated the size of a loaf of bread and whether you could sell sugar cookies to Native Americans when there was a sugar shortage. And that's all documented in uh, Yanni Venema's book. It's fascinating that it's, you know, it goes back that far. When people talk about the history of Albany, they, they have invariably bring up the political machine. You know, today we talk about, you know, the political machinations that go on and we can rattle off a hundred politicians' names like they were trading cards. Back in the day, I mean, you could mention Erastus Corning, Dan O'Connell, Jim Coyne, um, Nebraska Brace, all of these people who in one form or another helped develop and in some cases hindered development of the city. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the political leadership is absolutely part of the fabric and has been since we had our first mayor. Um, it has sometimes been more intertwined with the business fabric than it is now. You know, we do have certain ethics rules these days. So people wouldn't today think that the president of one of the most important banks would at the same time serve as mayor. That used to be super common. <laughs> uh, you know, the, and there, there's a lot of examples of things like that where there was uh, maybe a little bit of self-dealing along the way, but it wasn't always necessarily... Uh, corrupt, but it was often something we would definitely look askance at now. But it was very common then for the, the president of one or two or three banks at the same time to also serve as the mayor or the common council president or what have you. They were the they were literally the movers and shakers of the of the day and they controlled everything. Or they could create a position like Albany County Executive and then go hog wild from there. <laughs> there there is also that, yes. <laughs> For those who might not be aware, and, and this is, of course, probably the first question you get asked about your blog, your blog is called Hoxie, H-O-X-S-I-E, and it's got a picture of a chicken with a word balloon with the word Hoxie. Yep. Now, for those who don't, who are not super knowledgeable about the history of Albany, would you please educate them on what a hoxie is? Yeah, this is one of those situations where I made my bed and now I have to lie in it. When I was casting about to uh, to set off a blog that was just about Albany history, uh, 
separate from I used to have a personal blog as well where I did these articles from time to time. But when I was looking around for what to call it, what to do with it, I ran across an ad in it was actually a Schenectady directory, um, and it just had that picture. It just very atypical of advertising of the time. It had a picture of the rooster and a word balloon, and it just said Hoxie. And I thought, that's outstanding. Nobody in 1870 was advertising like that. There was, you know, at the time, advertising was so prolix. There was so much prose. There was trying to enunciate the millions of ways in which their product was, was the best for you and would solve all your, all your ills. Uh, and this one is just a just a picture and a word balloon. So I, I fell in love with it. I decided that was the name. It was a terrible name. I've recently got a comment on my blog about how it's the worst name for a history blog you could possibly have. And all I could say to the comment was, yes, <laughs> you are correct. But uh, now I'm stuck with it. And, I, and I'll say Hoxie was, was a good example. Uh, George Hoxie was a local uh, brewer and soda bottler. So he had both beer and root beer and sarsaparilla and things like that. Also, the Albany overseer of the poor. <laughs> so, you know, he had, he had a little bit going on in, uh, in business and a little bit going on in government. When you do your when you do your research for your blog, do you sometimes find yourself saying, if I had like one of these items from the past, whether it was a, an original can of beer from Hedrix or Dobler, or possibly, you know, a game program from the old Albany Senators baseball team or the Metro Mallers football team or something of that nature. Do you ever find yourself, you know, perusing through eBay and say, you know what, I want to get that for my personal collection. Just for that. I have, uh, yeah, that's a real potential. I have a, a couple of hoxy bottles, not a lot, but they, they have been given to me by family over time, naturally. And yeah, as I look at things, I start seeing things like hotel keys from from the old DeWitt Clinton and things like that and start saying, you know what, maybe I'm better off not being on eBay. <laughs> maybe it's just safer not to start collecting this memorabilia. But there is a lot of it out there for the folks who are interested in that sort of thing. If you want to find, you know, the DeWitt Clinton, the Kenmore, things like that, there's there are those opportunities and, and things like that do turn up. I mean, I found a few things for Keeler's, which was the old uh, white tablecloth West restaurant next to Jackson, downtown Albany. I mean, we yeah. have a Keeler's customized ashtray. Yeah. Every business used to have things like that, and it's just, it's just remarkable. I think if I were, I would be looking for some of the ones that nobody remembers, like the, the Capitol Hotel, which was down on Green Street. Now it's the, the back parking garage of the uh, of the bank that's down there. Nobody remembers that. It was very prominent in its day, and then it went to seed, and it's just fascinating to me that there was a gigantic 300-room hotel that nobody even remembers was there. Recently, I came across an old photograph of downtown um, North Pearl Street, and it was kind of fun to try to position where it would be in conjunction to the buildings that are there now. And unfortunately, the only building I could find that was in the photo that is still here today is the first church in Albany. And then it's just okay, there's some storefronts on the left that I can't really make out. And there's some storefronts on the right I can't make out. I posted it. And then all the Albany historians popped up and said, well, I know that business. And that means that this photo was taken such and such a date because that's there. And it's like, it's a fascinating thing. It's like you've opened up an avenue for every internet historic sleuth to come in and help solve the crime. Absolutely. And uh, depending on the photograph, you know, there are a couple of different Facebook groups where we where we have that sort of thing going on. We know who to call on if we think a car might be a, a, a clue to the date. We know who to call on if there's clothing styles that we think might help us. You know, so there are people who have real specialties in helping to nail down an era for those things, because you're absolutely right, especially that neighborhood. First Church is the only thing still standing. Again, it used to be surrounded by buildings. <laughs> And it's just the only thing there. And they, you know, tore out uh, a lot of the uh, surrounding area to make the highway ramp. For those who might not 
really know, and they think that Albany is, you know, just your generic capital city. In your research, what has been one or two of the things that you've found that have stood out as being uniquely Albany related, as opposed to this could just be anybody, any place? I, th I think the thing that is most remarkable, uh, especially among capital studies, a lot of people say in eh, capitals, it's government is the business. For the longest time in Albany, government was uh, very much not the business. <laughs> there was so much more going on. We had unbelievable amounts of manufacture. Uh, Troy was the collar city, sure. There was a lot of garment manufacturing going on in Albany. Um, I just tweeted yesterday because it was World Piano Day. We used to be the center of piano manufacture in the United States for a, for a period of time in the 19th century, but probably 40 or 50 years, we were the place. It was where it all happened. It was where the patents were developed. It was, there was just an endless amount going on. Uh, we used to be the lumber capital because so much of the lumber was, was uh, brought in through the Erie Canal down through the Champlain Canal, the uh, what I still call the Lumber District. I don't know if anybody else knows what that is, but you know, around the area where uh, where the Huck Fins is, that was all lumber. Um, so there was this huge amount of industry and business that that went on. Really, you know, until the the general decline that hit the Northeast obviously hit hit Albany and Schenectady and Troy, and we saw a lot of it go away, and the other forms predominated. And now I think we tend to forget that there used to be just so much of that, uh, right, and a lot of it right in the city. And of course, one of the um, one of the most proficient uh, writers of Albany history would be the great William Kennedy, and some of the things that he's put in his books have also been able to touch on the fabric of historic moments in Albany history. Of course, things like the, the Devil in Fire and the Flaming Corsage, uh, the story of the unrest in the late 60s in Shango's Beads, you know, um, the kidnapping of the mayor's son in Billy Phelan's Greatest Game, I mean, it, it's amazing sometimes to find all these historic moments that if it weren't for people like you and William Kennedy and some other historians, we might just have lost them to the fabric of time. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a good, a good point because it was, I wasn't even living in Albany at the time when, uh, when I was given a copy of Old Albany and was... That was the first thing that I read by by William Kennedy, and then I, you know went on and read the rest of the of the series. But I was amazed at the stories that he was telling, and obviously he has he has a much greater gift for storytelling than I have. I have an inability to sort of edit down to the essence. I'm, tr I'm I think of myself more as a a documentarian who's pulling something up out of the bottom of the uh, of the recycling bin to make sure it doesn't get thrown out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if somebody else wants to tell stories from that, great. I'm just trying to get the information back up there because it uh, it has been uh, you know lost and subsumed and forgotten over time. A couple more questions. Where do you think that blogging? to it will be going in the future especially for a history blog like hoxie uh it's a great question uh, these days i mean everybody wants everything to be done on facebook and it's really hard to attract people off of facebook and that's why i really appreciate your blog rolling doing doing that because i've never wanted to be on somebody else's platform i've had a blog since about 2002 i think was when i started with that uh, I am stuck having to promote it on Facebook if I want anybody to read it. Um, you know, there are subscriptions, but I get much more attention to a post when I put it on Facebook. But I think still there is a move with everything that's gone on with in terms of trust of these platforms and that sort of thing. I think there is a move to get people to look at other sources of information and to say, hey, you know, there's something beyond Facebook. You know, it, it has serious limitations. It's not searchable. Uh, I can't store things there. I can't really, you know, I, I can't preserve this and I can't really update 
uh, articles as I get more information like I can on my own platform. So it just has always made sense to have it off on my on my own and have to use social media to try to, try to promote it and get people to look at it. Okay. And when you are doing your research, what are some of the other blogs out there that you sort of read and think, dang, I wish I had thought of that article first, or he's got that all wrong. It didn't happen. <laughs> way. Ah. Yeah. Since uh, there's only a few of us that are kind of specializing in, in the history stuff. I, I certainly have, I've done a lot of uh, interchange and sort of basic help from Paula Lemire's blog from the Albany rural cemetery mm -hmm. uh, her personal blog before and now what the cemetery does that's that's a, a huge help and we do a lot of back and forth because most of the people i write about are buried in the cemetery so it works out very well and of course you know don rittner historically had uh, had a lot of articles uh that are helpful as sort of jumping off points as, as you look for these things um but most of it honestly comes from i'm i'm looking for one thing I see another that catches my eye in that old newspaper. I make a little clip. I say, okay, there's a folder called Hoxie Ideas, and uh, someday I come back to that. And as I've been going through this thing with the Albany Bicentennial tablets, there's a lot more <laughs> that I need to come back to. I'm like, okay, this is interesting, this is interesting, this is interesting. Hopefully there'll be shorter forms of interesting. Well, you never know. You, know, you get uh, stuck on a tangent, next thing you know, it's, you know, the history of some uh, bootery at the corner of, you know, Broadway and Maiden Lane or something. And mm -hmm. next thing you know, it's like you've got a 7,000 page blog post about a bootery that only existed for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, it can happen. Uh, I'm not not real good at editing myself, like I said, because I, I like to put the information out there once I've found it. Maybe somebody else needs the more complete form. So some sometimes we boil it down for the Facebook posts, but what I put on the blog is tends to be a little bit uh, wordy. Well, Carl, I really appreciate your being part of this. Thank you so much. For everybody else, it's hoxie.org. That's H-O-X-S-I-E.org. And if you start reading it, you probably will need to block off about four or five hours because you're going to get re cross reading on like seven or eight other articles. And then you're just going to be, you know, going down the hoxie rabbit hole, shall we say. <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs> All right, Carl. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Take care. All right.